We are back. Chapter 3, rights of the parties undertaking this position. So up till now, we have seen the criteria for a dead body. We've seen that there are different property concepts for a dead body. The most prevailing one we have now is quasi-property, which we know it means that there is what? A bunch of rights that are attached to the dead body, but it is not property in the true sense of the word. And we know that there are certain rights that belong to the person who take charge for disposition that cannot be interfered with. And now we're going to look at those rights. So once you take possession of a body, you are essentially invested with certain rights and responsibilities granted and imposed by the law for the protection of the decedent survivors and for the protection of the public. Right to arrange the disposition would be meaningless, as we've discussed even in Chapter 2, without a way to actually protect yourself from interference. If everyone and their dog could get involved with the process, imagine just how much fun it would be if you had to fight off non-interested parties for, for the pleasure of it. We've already beaten quasi-property proverbially to death, so we have a limited ability of what we can do with the body. It's not absolute dominion. We can't treat it like a piece of property because it's not. And importantly, it is subject to revocation. The party that grants it to us may also revoke it if we do not utilize the responsibility property properly. Sorry about that. So who do you think gives us the ability, gives us the rights? Think about that. The example from the book, this comes from a, ju a judge's opinion. We may consider it, the body, as a sort of quasi-property to which certain persons have may have rights, as they have duties to perform toward it, arising out of our common humanity. But the person having charge of it cannot be considered the owner of it in any sense whatever. He holds it only as a sacred trust for the benefit of all who may, from family or friendship, have an interest in it. Very nicely said, I think, right? Brings a tear to a glass eye. Mm-hmm. Well, if you've been pondering that question, who gives us the power? The state does. Police power. It's going to tell us, right? Who has ultimate authority and then maybe goes down from there in a hierarchy? So the state tells us. The state tells us. The person exercising the right of disposition is granted the right to take possession and control of the body. Well, Professor Finn, that kind of, you know, duh. But not really. Think about it. So if you had the right of disposition, but you did not have the right to take possession and control of the body, what could essentially happen is that you can say how you want the body disposed, but then you do not have a say on a viewing. You don't have a say maybe on what funeral home, etc., etc., etc. So you have the right to take possession, bring it to whoever will assist you in the process, and then anything with that. So this leads into a concept of actual and constructive possession. And this is a huge concept. Actual possession. All you have to ask yourself is, is the body itself in the immediate possession and custody of the person in charge? Physically within custody of a person, actual next of kin or legally authorized person. Are they in the same room with it? And if they are, you have actual possession. However, we give it to the funeral home, do we not? For the purposes of storage, preparation, funeralization. And then we have constructive possession. It is physically within the custody of another person at the funeral home, the mortuary. So if a person passes away, here in Florida we have medical examiners, up in New York I believe you have coroners, and the coroner orders an autopsy, the medical examiner down here performs an autopsy, and they're within the facility of the pathologist performing the autopsy. Do we have actual possession or constructive possession? And if you answered constructive possession, you're right, because we do not have possession of the body. They are performing something that their legal duties require, and then once it's done, the statutorily um, given obligation of that autopsy is done, the pathologist office is going to say, hey, who's picking this up? It is back within 
constructive possession, and we can tell them whoever it is we want the body to go to. And we only get custody of the body for the purpose of disposing of it. That would be important. We only get custody of a body for the purpose of getting rid of it. Possession and control of the body attaches from the moment of death when all the functions of the brain and brainstem cease and it may be continued for a reasonable length of time. And anytime you see the word reasonable, you know the trier of fact is going to determine if that is reasonable. And if you our trier of fact conversation from the business law review, you know that that is either the judge in a bench trial or the jury in a jury trial. What you might consider reasonable may not be what they consider reasonable. Length of time and reasonableness is determined by a number of factors. Circumstances of death. Longer time should be justified. Because remember, the person who gives you the power to dispose of the body reserves the right to revoke it. And if you don't get rid of it in time, a reasonable time, the state might intervene and go a route you preferred it wouldn't. So the individual undertaking this position has the power to exercise control over all matters relating to the funeral. Which funeral home, type of service, type of merchandise, which disposition. If they are in control, they are in control of everything. The right allows them to schedule it whenever they bloody well want. They can do it at the inconvenience of other people. They can disregard everyone's feelings. The person in charge doesn't have to care and they're not given a legal obligation to care about what you feel about it, okay? The individual is only bound by the laws regarding funeral homes, cemetery, or crematory, the laws of the state. And if they're complying with the law, there's not much else you can do about it. The right to disposition is an exclusive right. It is a paramount right of disposition. It cannot be compelled by law to share it with anybody else. The book's example talks about a divorced couple and their child dies. The primary guardian, the mother, excluded the father, and there was nothing he could do about it. The judge is ruling further evidence that even if he was invited, he could show up and the invitation could be revoked at that point. You walk up to the gravesite and they say, get out. And they bounced you. You've got to go. And this not only includes a funeral home, but any place ceremonies can take place. The example in the book shows that the cemetery orally complied to restrict attendance to a funeral and then did not do so. Then. We had some fun. He threw us a party. Woohoo! Skeet! Attendants, attendees dressed inappropriately, used illegal substances, disrupted the whole funeral. Absolutely brilliant. Upon suit, the judge ruled that she was entitled for breach of contract and for punitive damages. Not only did you make a contract with the oral statement, but you breached it so badly, because remember that review in contract law? You really have to be an overachiever to get punitive damages for violating a contract. This person succeeded with a gold star. Dumb, dumb, dumb. The individual with control of disposition is under no obligation to inform others of a death. For example, in the book says they have no legal right to be present. They may have been offended because not notified or invited. But no ground of complaint is afforded to the public in this account. Boo-hoo is basically what it, the judge is saying. If you don't invite someone, don't want to tell them of the death, you can be offended, you can feel bad, but that doesn't change anything. The fact that you are offended falls in the category and column of no one cares. If a next of kin wishes to exclude others, there are some steps that the funeral home should take and impose upon the next of kin or disclose they will do their best to comply, but that the next of kin is acting in contest to what the funeral home suggests. So, what are we doing here? We're limiting liability. And we're going to talk a lot about liability in the future. I promise you that. So what are some things you can do to prevent the all-out brawl or the apparent rave that happened at the grave site, right? I would have loved to have seen pictures of that one. Well, first thing is if you are going to publish an obituary and tell everyone in the world that someone died and there are people that you don't want there, which, first of all, defies logic, do not put a place in time. Do not put a place in time. If you are at the funeral home, you better damn well not put it up on the whiteboard or give it to the answering service because, you know, someone is just going to tell someone when they call in. That will open you up to a problem. 
do not put an announcement of time or place anywhere, including your website. We've already talked about the answering service. Have the next of kin sign an indemnification form to cover personal injury or property damage in the event it gets into a party. Okay. And above all else, hire the appropriate personnel to run security, off-duty law enforcement, private security firm, so that if they need to get people off, they can. And when someone asks me, hey, what should I do? And for my pathetic little honest opinion, you hire off-duty law enforcement. You contact your local um, precinct, you contact your um, local sheriff, and you find whatever the rate is for whatever many hours, however they bill, doesn't matter, and you get them to supply the individual. The reason for that is if the law enforcement organization supplies the cop, supplies the vehicles, etc., then they're also supplying insurance to cover them as well. And if you want someone removed, pretty much punch a security guard, yeah, that's debatable what happens next. You punch a cop, party starts. Okay, the cops generally do not like having people exhibit physical force upon them. So paramount right to custody equals right to choose method of disposition. If I get right to control funeral, I get the right to control disposal. Next of kin wanted cremation. Executor of will wanted burial. Will stated that the body was to be buried. And it was buried as the executor countermanded the order properly through the courts. Say, what? Upon suit from the next of kin, because you know people don't like being told by someone else they can't. The judge said the executor had the paramount right to arrange this position, so it was in his right because the will dictated what the deceased wanted. So what you see in a lot of state statutes is... At the top of the priority list for disposition, it says person um, deceased wishes, etc. So when we were talking about wills, there are some states that look to the will for guidance, but then also understand that a surviving spouse generally may have powers that supersede what a will might state, etc. In fact, the matter is, if they're arguing the will, they might not even get into that clause until after something's done, which is why you see that the executor had to petition the court to kind of put a stop on things. What you should do to protect yourself is put in a penalty clause. If my wishes are countermanded regarding my disposition, boom. Remember the whole interorum clause about contesting a will? Well, you're going to do your my terorum clause for not doing what I tell you to do. And if you put something in like that, that could be legally enforced against someone that is doing something in derogation of your wishes. Speak to your attorneys about that. And again, unless that will is read prior to the funeral, it doesn't quote-unquote apply. Make sure you have a copy of the will at the funeral home and advise your clientele accordingly. Do not get involved in the middle of it, but the executor says, what should I do? Contact an attorney. If the spouse says, what do I do? You say, contact an attorney, preferably not the same attorney. So funeral director with the right of disposition, how do we get it? Well, first of all, where do we get any rights? If you said the state, that's one, but you also get rights from the client, right? So the first one, the state, imposed and granted by statute. The rights are defined and provided by the statutes, ordinances, and regulations of the jurisdiction where the funeral home operates. Laws and licensing regulations allow the funeral director to do our profession and say upon what bounds we can do things. So transporting bodies, embalming, conducting services, etc. And the contract itself. Remember, we have no right in our professional capacity with respect to a dead body until such time as we form a contract with the client. Once we enter into the contract with our client, we receive rights expressly or implicitly, to do our job. So with the contract in general, it's an agreement between the funeral director and a competent person of legal age, someone who with the capacity or privity of contract. Consumer purchases, funeral director agrees to provide merchandise or goods and services. The contract can be written or oral. Well, Professor Finn, what about the Federal Trade Commission funeral? Not now. Not now. This is talking about formation of a contract. 
not the statement of goods and services. Be very careful. Remember, didn't we just see that a guy, funeral director, whoever it was, said, oh, yeah, 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 I'll take care and make sure no one shows up to the cemetery and does inappropriate stuff. Then they started using drugs, dressing you know, in bikinis or whatever, and had a party. Contract forms. So we're talking about contract. Can be written or oral. Can be expressed or implicitly applied. So if an individual dies in a nursing home, the name of the funeral home is left by the family. The funeral home has an implied contract to perform the removal. They left the name, we should go get it. Contract can be between the funeral home and the estate. Family, or an unrelated third party. So this first one, the estate, is always an implied party to the contract since it's primarily responsible for disposition. We've seen that there is a funeral debts clause in a will, so the estate can pay the bill ultimately if there's you know, money to pay. Funeral directors often have the next of kin sign to show that the funeral home has authority to conduct the contracted services and to provide another source of payment in the event the estate is insolvent. Well, by signing a contract, it removes, you know, remember the writing, the four corners rule? Here's my stuff. You are giving me rights to do what I need to do, and I can come after you for payment. And the third party can be employers, armed forces, government welfare agencies, Catholic dioceses. Okay? If you do a funeral for a priest, generally you will deal with a human resources individual who covers the financials and a next of kin that authorizes other parts of the funeral. Now, Federal Trade Commission, in addition to our contract, the Federal Trade Commission funeral rule truth and lending provision in some states may require additional disclosures as well as additional acts. So price of the funeral, list of all services and merchandise. Price of each supplemental item of service and merchandise. List of cash advances, method of payment. You can have the contract without the paperwork. But you know, if you don't have the paperwork when you're supposed to, which we will discuss ad nauseum, okay, that that is a problem. In some states with this requirement, the funeral director may be required to give a written memorandum of the transaction. Obviously, written contracts are more legally sound. Obviously, that's a requirement of federal law. Okay. So, quick refresher. To ensure a form is enforceable, it should be reviewed by legal counsel. Well, yeah, but for the most part, you know that the Federal Trade Commission is going to offer you a generic form, which they recommend should serve as a template. And as long as you kind of match the template, you really can't go wrong here. But nevertheless, you should present an attorney skilled with this um, to kind of look things over and make sure you comply. But usually in mortuary school, there is an assignment somewhere where we say, hey, make a price list for your funeral home. We kind of look it over and then kind of tell you, yeah, good, yeah, bad. So the following are standard items included that are universal across all forms and usually as a result of the F FTC funeral rule. First is itemization. Federal Trade Commission requires price itemization of the components of the funeral service. Some states want you to go a bit more deeper into that. That's a uh, statement of cash transaction. Okay, It's not a credit. That way truth and lending might not have to apply. Credit transactions require many disclosures, so you don't really, really want to have to deal with that if you don't have to. Late payment charges. You can charge a late payment. Consult your state laws to ensure there's no legal ceiling to the amount. Uh, and they give you a, a sample clause in the book. Collection fees. You can say you can charge collection fees in addition to late payments and reasonable attorney's fees. Good times there. Estate liability. Okay. Contract signer is liable for the debt as well as the estate, and the contract should have that wording, especially if the primary liability, according to your state, rests with the estate. Because if you don't get the signer to agree to pay the bill, you can't go after them if the estate fails to pay. You can still charge late fees to an estate, but typically we do workarounds for that. And your own businesses you work for will tell you, you know, in the grand scheme of things, what's permissible, what's not within your scope of business. Joint and several, well, we've seen that already. Always have a statement that makes signers jointly and severally liable. Um, jointly means that each of them owe a specific portion of the total, but they're not responsible for the rest. That's the trick. Per head, this is what you owe. And several then means that in case I don't get everyone, all of y'all that's left are going to have to pay for what's been owed. Disclaimer of warranties. We did talk about uh, warranty of fitness, warranty of mercantility, etc. 
So again, you want to disclaim it if you can. Pretty much all funeral directors and all funeral homes do it. Uh, some states don't let you do it, so make sure that if you are in a state or in a state that does not permit you to disclaim, you do not do it. And ensure that people understand that warranties and merchandise are made by the manufacturers or the suppliers, A or B, preferably the manufacturer, not you. Folks, thank you for your attention. We will see you in the next chapter.